So let me repeat this. What is the essence of monad? The essence of monad is composition. It's all about composition. It can be used to compose any kind of Pleisley arrows. The fact that Pleisley arrows are so useful for doing side effects is a separate issue, right? This is why monads are usually associated with side effects. Because if you want to combine Pleisley arrows, if you want to compose them, you have to use a monad. It's really simple. Mona, composition. Okay, so let's um, let's play a little bit with definitions. Because now it's time to define what a mona is. <clears throat> so we have just like like we define what a functor is, right? By specifying, by abstracting the type constructor and saying uh, that uh, it has to, it's a class of type constructors, right? That supports fmap. Here it's a little bit more, a bigger mouthful, right? But it's the same idea. So it's there's a class of types called monad and this is not your usual definition from, from prelude but I'll write it as if it were okay and then I'll explain why it's not so class monad m so that's our type variable that's actually of the kind star arrow star that's a type construct where, and this is what it has to support. It has to support this return guy, right? Return, whose uh, signature is A to MA. Right, so that was our identity for Kleisley arrow. It's a Kleisley arrow that as close to identity as possible and it has to support the fish operator whose signature is this can I copy and paste this here? yes <laughs> so just imagine that this is true okay so this is the class there plus the, these uh, three additional uh, properties, axioms of, of monad that make it uh, a, essentially a monoid. <coughs> now, this is not what you will see defined in the prep. And actually, before I, I tell tell I, I tell you what it is in, in the prep, let me ask. Let me add a little bit more. Okay. Remember we, we, we said something about a functor? So, to say that M actually is a functor, not only, that like the precondition for something being a monad, it also has to be a functor, right? So, this is done by, by saying, you know, class, and here we put, Functor M arrow monad. So we, I, I have inserted this functor M precondition, right? Constraint. Constraint. That not only monad has to support these two, but it also has to support F. So that's one way of saying this. Okay. Now there is another definition that's uh, a little bit better known, where instead of defining the, the full complete fish, we define sort of like half a fish. 
<laughs> it's called bind. Bind. It's, uh, it's a radioactive fish. Radioactive fish. That's <laughs> bad. <laughs> yeah, or or it's a fish with double tail no. and no head. <laughs> Headless fish. Okay, it's called bind. And instead of taking two functions, it sort of bypasses this this thing and says, okay, just give me the result of this first function, right? Don't give me the whole function that produces this monadic value, right? Just give me the result of it and I'll bind it to the function. So it takes as the first argument, it takes an A. So this, think of this as a result of the Kleisley error. Right? So we have a Kleisley error from A to MB, right? So let's forget that we have a Kleisley error, which is, it will return an MB. So let's bind MB to the next Kleisley error, which is a function, and I'm renaming on the fly, okay? So instead of B, I'm using A. And I'm using B here. No, sorry, MB, right? So it's like, this is the result of the first Kleisley arrow. This is the second Kleisley arrow, right? And it returns <coughs> some MB. And you can see kind of that it's really easy to define a Kleisley arrow if you have bind. So you you kind of have to like, uh, write a lambda uh, because you want to return a function, so you return lambda that takes uh, a, right, and then it applies this function, uh, it binds it with this, and so on. Yeah. Home. Oh, actually, I, was, I didn't want to introduce this one, but let me introduce this. Okay, so first of all, in this case, actually we don't have to, to say it's a function. Because using these two operators, bind and return, we can define f map. Uh, there's a trick to it. You do some, uh, a little bit of Tetris, and you get that. <coughs> okay. But there is another definition that sort of is more useful in the case of lists, and we actually used it there. It was instead of having the bind operator, what you really need is John. Join is a function that the uh, generalization of this concatenation thing, right? Because we said, okay, we can use concatenation to define the fish, right? But in general, you can define a, a function that looks similar. You remember it was double list, list of lists into a list. Now replace list with m. And you get something that takes m of m of a and flattens it, produces m a, m a, okay? So if you look at uh, the definition, if, if you like go back to the definition of uh, the fish operator for uh, list, it actually doesn't use the listiness of this the only thing that, that's uh, peculiar to a list was this concat. But instead of concat, you can use join, which has the right signature. Replace concat with join, and you get for any monad that has join and is a functor, you can uh, define the fish. Okay. So that's just good to know. 
right? So, so all these three definitions with, with fish, with bind, and with join are equivalent. You can pick any one of them, right? So I'm going to erase this. Now the new thing in Haskell is that this constraint that is really redundant because you can show that it's a functor if you have bind was replaced with an even stronger constraint okay, which I will not explain but it's called applicative it's, and it's also when you have a class defined like this that it depends on another class, you can call it a superclass. So, like, applicative is a superclass of monad. Every monad has to be automatically applicative. And actually, every monad defined with bind is automatically ap applicative. So, this is like sort of kind of backwards. And so, that was like a recent change, right? The recent you know, change, yes. Why, why did it take so long? If it's not too long, why why did they put it in wrong? Because because uh, well, first of all, history, right? Um, and and second thing is that with bind, you actually get functor and applicative automatically. It's just that you cannot call these functions uh, pure the monad because they already exist in applicative named pure right so you have to have different names for that so in applicative there's a pure in, uh, in monad it was called return and also the operator that's in applicative start what happens is historically you know, monad was not defined in terms of applicative there wasn't a sort of a standard applicative in the prelude but people added it and in order to get over the fact that it was already a, a return function they couldn't reuse the name they used pure and then they had the, the unification where they made applicative a superclass of monad and kind of one of them was redundant there yeah so, so it's, it's you can messy. call return pure right now. Yes. i mean re is yeah. there's a requirement right. but the that thing is that if pure. you want to define your own monad nowadays you have to first show that this m is a functor so you have to define f map for it then you have to define this this operator star in angle brackets i don't know it's called apply i think yes ah. yeah. yeah well it's called app in mona right so well just like return pure is called return uh, this operator is called app well, I think this but these are technical. I think the relationship between the, the, the mathematical objects you know, people have known about you know, forever, uh, and they were just introduced at different times into the standard library. And so you know, originally they just, they just weren't formally related, even though from a category theory perspective, they, the relationship's always been in there. So, so the definition in category theory starts with a functor and says that um, not, not, not doesn't use bind, uses join. They call it, I think, one is called eta, the other is called mu. So, so yeah, join is called mu for multiplication, because it's sort of like a multiplication, <coughs> and the other is called eta for, because the units are called eta. Neutral elements. So. Okay, so these are technical details. You don't have to know this. Um, but so let me show you. So from now on, we'll be using this definition. Okay, and I won't be even mentioning the applicative because it's a uh, complication on top of it. Um, just think of a monad like this. Okay. 
so l let me give you an example. How would we define uh, bind, uh, let's say, for either? Okay? okay. Erase this. So I, I didn't put either here, but either is like a better version of maybe. But instead of nothing, you actually have a string or something else. So, so do I want to hold? Yeah, okay. So let's say instance. So if you want to show that some particular uh, functor uh, is a, is a, or type constructor is a monad, you have to say instance. So you have a class monad, and this is the instance of this class. Instance of monad that either S for string, right? Yeah. Is an instance of mo. Where? And here you have to show that this is a monad, so it has return. You can define return for it, and you can define uh, bind for it, right? So this is like class methods, and here you are defining a particular class that inherits from monad, you can think of this like implementation. This is like uh, an interface, right? And this is an implementation. So what, what's return? So return takes some A or some, what's called an X value, right? And it has to produce an either of this X. So there are two constructors for either, right? Left and right. Left is for returning errors. But no, in general, you know, this is our interpretation. Right? You know, traditionally, the first argument is for returning errors. But you can use it in different ways as well. So, um, so if you want to have this to behave like, uh, like a unit, you actually want to return right rather than left. Left means, oh, this function failed. Right means, okay. And the type of x is a, right? And, uh, and you want to return either string or a. So you have, you have to be right if you want to return something that's based on, on, on x, you know, on a. So it will be right a. Okay? Yeah, you understand why this is like the only option that, that we have? We're looking just at types. <laughs> we have something of type A and uh, we want to use it to create a, an either. So the left would actually contain a string would have nothing to do with A. But right actually uses something of type A that we have at our disposal. <laughs> this is another little miniature Tetris. And now we have to define this guy. Okay, so this guy takes um, an either A. Um, let's call this PA, right? That's a value of type either A. And we bind it to a function. This is a function, this is this function. This function often is called a continuation <laughs> because you can say, okay, we are binding this thing to a continuation. It continues the calculation with the same kind of uh, side effect. Right? It's like the rest of the co computation and eventually returns what the, the end of this calculation produced. Right, so this is our continuation. In, in fact, people sometimes call it K for continuation. C would not be a good letter for it, so K is, is, a, is a better thing. Um, so what can we do with this guy? Like, you know, we have to decapsulate it, right, first. In order to, we, have to, we have to call K with something that sits inside this EA. 
right? K accepts A. <coughs> yep. So we need to extract A from this. So the only way to extract something from an ether is to pattern match. So we'll do case of case EA of. So we are matching EA to two patterns. One is left with some S string, right? And, and the other is right with some value x. So in the case where this is s, we treat this as an error. So we will skip the continuation. We'll just shortcut, right? Short circuit the continuation. We are not doing the rest of the calculation. There was an error. We cannot continue, right? This is how exceptions work. You throw an exception, the rest of the calculation <coughs> is not performed because you don't have the right arguments for the rest of the calculation. So you just return back left x. Now if you have right x, oh, then you can call k, right? And k acting on x does exactly the right thing, right? Because K returns N B. And you want to return N B. Right? Nothing special. So this is how you define these things. In every case it's a little different. Like defining bind for the state monad, for instance, it, it takes a lot of Tetris. <laughs> You have to be a master of Tetris. But, you know, don't have to. Fortunately, so, the Prelude does it for you. Yeah. It's already been in the Prelude. Yeah, Prelude does have all these basic monads defined. So you don't have to do this. But this is a, a good example. Uh, so notice that what, what happens here. Inside this operator, we are doing this pattern matching, right? And the short circuiting inside this operator. So we don't have to do this stuff, repeat this stuff inside of this function here. So we have really abstracted this common part of all these functions that we're taking either and returning either. It's done here. Abstracted. Very nice. Okay. So now you see the progression from this either to either to now this Kleisley arrow and, and finally to bind. Okay. Um, now finally, this is not how people write monadic code. You know, when you are using a monad to do some calculation. What actually happens is there is syntactic sugar for it that makes writing monadic code much easier. So essentially, if, you, if you're writing monadic code, you would get some value, monadic value, right, like MA. And then you would bind it to the rest of the calculation. And the rest of the calculation can be written as lambda that <coughs> takes the value from the first one, right, uh, and continues the calculation. And inside of this, you can, again, decompose it into, you know, so I'm, I'm using this value that was passed to me to do some monadic transformation, something that returns a monad, monadic value, and then bind it to yet another one, and so on. So it's like a nesting of these bindings. I bind something to the continuation. Inside this continuation, I bind something to another continuation, and, and so on. Right? So it's like Russian dolls of continuations. 
And this can be simplified by using the do notation. I don't know if I want to show you the example of how to desugar this stuff or not. Well, okay, so, so let's suppose that we want to like both do a safe square root and, and then um, find the reciprocal of, of the square root, right? So both of these functions are partial functions, right? The, the first one doesn't like negative numbers, the second one doesn't like zero. Right? So if you want to chain these two functions, so normally we would say, you know, um, so safe SQRT, and this is the safe SQRT uh, that takes a double and returns an either string or double. Right? Because now we know that we can actually chain these things using our special power of binding. Right? So we don't need to take either as, a, as an input because the, the either from previous cal calculation is actually decomposed inside the binding. <clears throat> so if you wanted to follow safe SQRT <coughs> with doing the inverse, we could write some code like this. Uh, we could say safe SQRT bind this okay so say sqrt returns an either of string double but this is decomposed inside this operator so what's passed here is actually something of type double so we need a function that takes a double right and inverts it reciprocates it Oh, by the way, did I did I tell you that lam I'm using the letter lambda? <laughs> you normally don't use Greek letters in uh, Haskell code, so in Haskell you just use a lambda with without the other leg. <laughs> <laughs> okay. so, thanks. Well, I like to prop it a little bit, so I write it like this, because otherwise it feels like it's gonna fall. <laughs> <laughs> but from the keyboard you just need the backstage. <laughs> okay. So safe SQRT returns an either, but uh, we are really interested in, in uh, the case when it succeeds, right? So the continuation is only for the success case in which I get some x that's the square root, right? If this guy fails, remember bind will not call this continuation. Bind will just return the error that this guy returned, the left. Right? But if it succeeds, it will, it will give me an x. So this is the continuation that supposes success. So we have this lambda, and now what can we do? Well, we can say if x is equal to 0, then, if it's equal to zero, then it will just return uh, left. left, right? I, I, I want to do a reciprocal. Left. Oh. Ah. Ah, I'm gonna do 45 minutes anyway, huh? So, and see here, like, you know, Error. Division by zero. Division by zero. So, right? Okay. Else. Else. No, we can just return one over x, right? Well, except that the continuation is supposed to return an either. So we have to um, return right. 1 over x, right? 
And uh, so we could write here write 1 over x, but we are in a monad. Us, so we should, we should say return. Could you also write the left as a fail? Indeed. Uh, that uh, will basically throw just abort your process. No, but fail is for monads is implemented. No, fa fail is not part of. Wow. Well, I thought it was. That's what. There's no, one example. Okay, there's, there's a contra controversy about whether fail belongs <laughs> in the monad or not. <laughs> Categorically speaking, <laughs> yeah. No. But, but it is in there, I think. But it's, 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 I think they, they want to separate into m monad zero, I think. Right. You're defining reciprocal. Reciprocal. Yeah. No. No, no. So I'm I'm defining say one over square root reciprocal of square root. Say rec squared. Say yeah. rec squared. How could rec squared ever be safe? <laughs> <laughs> The reason I brought up fail is because one time I saw this really cool example that instead of, let's say, in safe square root, instead of defining it as an either, it was defined as a, any arbitrary monad. And then the, the caller could provide which monad you want. So mm. then if you could provide it a, a maybe, you would just get nothing or just. Mm. But if you provide yes. an either, so that way, if you write left, it will be tied to either. And that's uh -huh. why I thought if you write fail, you could choose which monad you want. That's yeah. That might be better expressed as a, another type class, which itself, whose subclass is monad, which has an error, which is I think effectively what monad zero is, okay. where where you have the failure case as a part yeah. of the type class. Yeah. But it, it all, it's all basically the same, I think. Okay, so now you see that the 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 the, key, the, the word return kind of makes it look more. It kind of makes sense because you do it at the end. Because so you have you have the result here, and you're returning this result. But there's no, no stack frames. You're not no. returning from a stack no. frame or no. <laughs> And then of course you could take this and and uh, chain it with some other uh, safe function and so on. So so this this can be repeated many times. <coughs> But it's kind of awkward because you have to um, write these lambdas and you have to write this bind. And Haskell programmers are lazy, right? Just like uh, the language. So um, they invented the do notation. In the do notation, this same thing. is has syntactic sugar on top to simplify. So I would say is the syntactic sugar starts with do. So this is the do block. When you enter the do block, you are doing monadic operations. Now the compiler figures out what mon what monad you are talking about. Okay? So you don't have to specify, oh I'm in the either monad. It will figure it out. Are you defining safe rec squared? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So when when you apply something, you know, when you have something um, that is is continued, you just say, well, this. Let me define a why that is obtained from, say, SQRT X, okay? This is just a piece of, of notation that looks very much like imperative stuff, right? So save SQRT of, of X will return an either, right? Mm -hmm. But this either is passed to bind 
and then received by a lambda. This part, passing it and receiving, you know, is hidden. Whatever this is, it becomes just this. Left arrow, Y. Y left arrow, right? So this is replaced by left arrow. And Y now is a double. Okay? Because this is this, this Y inside the lambda. Okay? So here's a function. The, the rest of the code will use Y because it's part of this whole continuation. And now I want to do some coding, right? So if that should be Y, right? This should be Y. Yeah. I was renaming on the fly. My internal compiler failed. <laughs> <laughs> no, really? If Y equals zero, then left. Div by zero, okay, else return one. I have forgotten about these parentheses so many times that I finally learned to put parentheses after return or a dollar sign. Because right? this, this binds, you know, the binding rules. That's you still haven't got the uh, imperative use of return in C++ out of your head yet, right? Mm -hmm. I no, mean, if you're the used fact to return that from Java or C++ or C or yeah. C sharp or whatever, you're used to it being a statement, not a function. Right. Yeah. It's a, it's um, a function. Which, which actually... Yeah. yeah? I have no idea why that looks prettier than return if y then left else <laughs> 1 over y. That's, that's because these... I find that extraordinarily confusing and really? I think, Yeah. But it's it's just syntactic sugar for this thing. I know, but... Uh, but this if is, you, this if is you error the, wrong. The, the now, if you are going to say that return should have some semantic hint, then you should be returning 1 over y or div by 0. It gets a lot prettier when you have multiple. Oh no, but remember what return is in in either the either moment. Return is No no I right. I, right? I, I agree. This is left. I just don't like So well, in, in well, monad plus plus like you you return. would use fail instead. Use pure instead then. Problem solved. Yes. It is yeah, distraction. Yeah, I think I think he was talking about the use of return, not the nesting thing. Because yeah, you know, in this case where you're only you're only nesting one deep, the the advantage to do over the regular you know, d sugar is yeah. marginal. But it's, if you're yes. nesting n deep, I think it's what you were about to say, Richard. Right? Then it becomes yeah yeah uh, a big deal. The more binds you have here, the harder it gets to write it this way, and the easier it is to write it and understand it. But notice what we have done here. This is funny, really. Because we started by saying, oh, we want to track side effects, so we have to explicitly pass these things, return these things that signify side effects, like the state, you know, we have to pass the state, or so the signatures of functions include this, uh, this side effect and so on. The do notation now moves back and hides these side effects. You see, this, this looks like regular code that does not care that we are using the either monad. Does not care about failure. Save SQRT can fail, but we are writing code as if it never failed. Right? We are saying we are extracting y no matter what. Uh, you don't mean fail this case, you mean returning nothing. Returning nothing or left. Yeah. That's uh, a left. failure. Oh, sorry, yes. Left. Yeah. Yep. Returning okay. left means failure. Yes. Right? We use this uh, either monad to 
to simulate exceptions. So this looks, m again, it looks more like the exception code in, in imperative programming, right? You assuming that everything works, if this fails, it will throw an exception and bypass this, right? But you've got the failure case for div by zero right there, but not... It create, you're generating the failure, though. You're I, not dealing I, with the failure. I case. want to do this, but okay. I don't have to, you know? I could, instead of So this, if you had safe rec... I could say... Yes. Safe rec. Exactly. That was my first idea, actually. But I wanted to put some actual code here. The do notation lets you emphasize on the happy path, you know, the success case. Yeah, yeah. You, know, you don't want to deal with side effects explicitly again, right? So first we started, we want to deal with side effects. Uh -huh. Now we are using do notation that hides these side effects. And you're not supposed to be, the novice is not supposed to be confused that you're, you're Say safe rack instead of pure safe rack or return to safe rack. Why? No, because safe rack already returns an ether. Right? So I don't have Fine to. Fine with me, yeah. I right. don't have to en encapsulate it. But if you want to change to a third safe function which takes. Oh, but, but, but if I wanted either. to say, you know, I could say return y plus y for some reason then I have to use return. Because y is a double. You want to add another double to it, right? Well, it would convert it, but I can write it like this. I don't have to. Right? I use return. But if I want to call a function that returns either, then I don't need return. I see. So the point is that y is a premonadic value which is guaranteed to that pure y is the monadic value that safe squared returns. Safe squared returns the monadic value, but we are ignoring this fact. We are hiding the binding. The bind does, does for us the ugly stuff. Okay. We don't have to do it. We hide it. I, I know, it, it takes some getting used to it. This actually looks much better, but it will be harder to, to write an example for the state monad, okay? Because in the state monad, you would have to like keep passing the state over and over, and, you know, and remember, okay, this is S prime, um, and after applying this function, it will be S double prime, okay, if you, forget about putting another prime, you'll be returning the previous state, and it will totally... Yeah, but if you just write it with fish, then everything works fine. Yes, but with do notation, you can use the state monad identically. So like, you know, some, some computation returns a state, which is a function that contains your value that you want to retrieve, right? But you write it as if you were getting this value directly. You don't see state at all. The state is passed through bind, and bind is hidden. So, in the state monad, do notation is beautiful. And it looks like imperative code with side effects. <laughs> so, we're back to it, right? But, but the difference is that all these functions that are using inside the do, um, they have their signatures that show you that they have side effects, right? So in fact, this is how the compiler knows that we are inside either monad, because it looks at this. Oh, save SQRT returns an ether. And we are assigning it to someone. So it knows that it's an ether monad because and how do you, how does it know that the y isn't the string as opposed to no because it the knows no oh you, you mean that whether it's left or right yeah this code works whatever it is left or right because binding will do different things whether it's left or right and, and if it's left and if it's left it will skip the rest yeah. Yeah. 
Look at the desugared version of it. Because of this. Because of this bond here. Yeah. If it's left, then it just. It's because F yeah. is the current parameter. And K, which is your uh, the rest of your function, never mm -hmm. gets called in the left case. So it's because the string is the current parameter. Yes. Yeah. You think of k there as being, as I say, as Bach said, the continuation yeah. is the rest of your function. Uh -huh. That only gets invoked if it's right. You see, the compiler sees this. Save SQRT. Oh, it takes double and returns either string and double. So we are inside the either monad parameters by string. Yeah. So it knows all this stuff. And, and notice that the string does not occur anywhere in the do notation. It's not visible here. So we are hiding the side effects. Right? First we expose them, now we are hiding them. But we are hiding it in a, in a type safe way. Compiler desugars this and he sees this, right, and checks the types. Do they work? With bind, well, without bind, you have all this case pattern matching boilerplate. Mm -hmm. So bind allows you to sort of consolidate it all to one place. Uh, so so you're applying your boilerplate in a consistent and principled fashion wherever you yeah. use it, and then do makes that even easier to use on top of that. So you're not you're not writing uh, your error checking code. Copy, you're not copy and pasting your error checking code n times at every yeah. uh, n. So you have abstracted it in into bind. And inside do, you actually hide the bind. And for compiler guys, somebody writing a compiler using this, your, your uh, bind method would squirrel away symbol and source locations into your state object without you ever having to remember to do it. Yeah. And there will be, be beautiful be error messages. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That's it for today. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.